Game of Thrones ran for about a decade, during which it was one of pop culture's most instantly influential television shows. It was so powerful that despite the final season being torn apart by critics and fans, spin-offs and prequels are being picked up left and right by the networks. Before we get tempted to enter into the House of the Dragon, we wanted to look back at some of the other houses we knew and loved. So get comfortable in your pointy thrones, grab a goblet of Dornish wine, and come with us while we rank Game of Thrones houses from good to evil. For this list, we'll be looking at the greater and lesser houses of Westeros that had considerable screen time during the eight seasons of Game of Thrones. Obviously, there won't be room for all the minor houses, but we did our best to make sure the most important were included. We will be considering the following factors. The intentions of the house, the impact the house had on the realm, positive or negative, and the best and worst members of the house. As you may well be fearing, it gets complicated with which characters are counted for which house, but we've been sure to outline our arguments in all of the questionable cases. We will, of course, have to look at some Westerosi history to provide context, but to keep things fair, we'll only be using content that is made clear in the show. We will not be taking into consideration content from solely the books, nor any other outside sources. We'll be breaking these up into two categories, the good and the bad to evil. Finally, and this should go without saying, but be warned, for the video is dark and full of spoilers. Now let's get to it. First up, we have the good. These are the houses that had a net positive impact on the realm. We're not going to say they're perfect, but the lords and ladies we meet from these houses have earned a higher standing by the old gods and the new. Taking the gold medal of good is House Stark. This should come as no surprise for fans of the show. From the very first episode, they're painted as one of the oldest and most honorable houses, with good reason. Though mistakes were definitely made, most of them were made honestly and with the best of intentions. House Stark is also a rarity in that there are no bad wolves in the pack. While many of the houses, as you'll see later on, have strong and weak links, there are no Starks who we consider bad or evil. It made it very hard to pick the best and worst members of this house to analyze. Our selections for the best members are Eddard Stark and his daughter Arya. Eddard had his faults, to be certain. Despite having what we would argue is the strongest moral compass of the show, his purity blinded him to the dangers that he, his children, and the entire realm were in. The man who passes the sentence should swing the sword. It did make him less effective, yes, but all the more outstanding in our eyes. Arya, on the other hand, actually performs the most evils of any Stark in the house, but ultimately uses what she has learned to save the realm. Ned was good through steady, consistent actions that brought him honor. Arya was good through a single, unmatchable deed. Our selections for the weakest members are Rickon and Bran. Rickon was not bad. To clarify, he was just the least developed of the pack. Bran is also a source of good, objectively speaking. With some of the hardest challenges to face throughout the show, he had more opportunities to indulge in a more selfish side. Even still, he's ultimately the king that brings peace to the realm once more and that is pretty damn impressive for the Stark who took last place. The other members of the family are Sansa, Caitlyn, Lyanna, Benjen, and Rob, all of whom try their best for their family and their bannermen alike. Taking the silver medal of good is House Martell. This one is a little messy. There are constantly murders, conspiracies, and revenge plots happening in and around House Martell for seasons four and five where they're prominently featured. Murdered Martells seem to be a big motivator for other characters. On that note, let us remember that Alaria Sand and the Sand Snakes are not Martells. They may have been Oberyn's family, but they all carry the bastard name of Dorne. That means the very harsh shift in season five where they backpedal from Oberyn's vow to not ever harm a child will not be counting against his house. You have my word. You don't hurt little girls in Dorne. Though Elia's death was sort of a character in and of itself, we only ever see three true-born Martells on screen. Oberyn, Doran, and Tristan. Oberyn Martell is one of the best characters in the run of the show. He loved his sister and wants nothing more than to avenge her murder at the hands of the Lannisters. But the Red Viper of Dorne is careful to plot his revenge in a way that will not spawn retaliation against his country, which is why he ultimately champions Tyrion Lannister. Dorian is a quieter character and easily defeated, but we admire the inner strength it takes to continually not lead his country to war. He looks out for his realm first and foremost, even when his decisions are not beloved. We think the weakest Martell is Tristan, but he is still a boy and didn't get very much screen time before being overthrown by the Sand Snakes. Taking the Bronze Medal of Good is House Reed. 
As you're likely to see with this list, houses with only a few characters are often put at an advantage. While technically we see three reads on screen, we're only properly introduced to Jojen and Mira. Even if you didn't love their arc, which honestly most fans didn't, it was hard to fault the reads for their slower paced trek. They show up to help Bran reach the Three-Eyed Raven north of the Wall. Jojen sacrifices his life for the process and Mira continues fighting for him all the way back to Westeros. The reads are brave, loyal, and instrumental in helping to bring about the end of the Night King. Between the two of them, it's next to impossible to choose a stronger and weaker member because they made such an excellent team. A close contender was House Tarth. Brienne of Tarth, the only character we're looking at to represent the house, was very close to taking our bronze spot. She's the most loyal character in the entire show and has some of the purest intentions overall. It's also worth mentioning that she makes good on all of those intentions once enough time has passed because of her admirable persistence. Unfortunately, we also promised that we'd be looking at the house's overall impact on the realm. Because Brienne's actions did less to impact the larger wars, we gave the medal to the reeds, but it was a good fight. This one hurts because Brienne was stronger as a character than Mira or Jojen, but it's hard to compare against magic powers and a prophesized role in the war against the Night King. Up next is another northern house, House Mormont. Bannermen to the Starks, the Mormonts of Bear Island have proven themselves time and time again. The two best examples of House Mormont are Jorah and Lyanna. Jorah is one of the rare characters to make it all the way from Season 1 to Season 8, during which time he goes from spying on the Targaryens to serving them. He has done terrible things, yes. He's sold to slavers, which goes against the laws of Westeros and the morals of his family. From his exile, he becomes a spy, causing harm to Daenerys. When he sees what a wonderful ruler she could be, he decides to back her over the Usurper. This leads to several seasons of redemption for his betrayal. Lyanna Mormont doesn't have the same amount of screen time, but was quickly deemed a fan favorite. The Lady of Bear Island is bold, noble, and unafraid to put her life on the line to save the North, even when she herself is but a child. Jor Mormont is a fair and prudent commander of the Night's Watch, but he's also our pick for weakest Mormont. Leaders on the Wall often have to make the most difficult decisions of the realm. We all remember the bold stand that Jon Snow made against the Army of the Dead, but that was a fight started under Jor's command. More questionable are his harsh compromises. The fact that he keeps the tentative peace with Craster, one of the worst men on the show, until dying in a mutiny really didn't help his cause. We understand where he was coming from, but watching Craster abuse his wives and daughters while also sacrificing his sons to the White Walkers was an awful lot for the Lord Commander to condone. Following them is House Tyrell. It's hard to know if the motivations of House Tyrell are ever truly pure. We would argue that they're perceived as good largely because they contrast the desires of a more sinister family. For most of the show, we see the Tyrells struggling to get power out of the hands of the Lannisters and the bastard Baratheons alike. Since those two were very corrupt houses, it was not hard to see this as an act of good, even if it was mostly self-serving. The two most exemplary members of House Tyrell are Lady Olena and her granddaughter Marjorie. Lady Olena is the best at plotting. She even conspires with Littlefinger to make sure that her granddaughter is not subjected to Joffrey's abuses as his queen. Normally we don't condone murder, but you remember Joffrey, right? She also does her best to rescue Sansa from the capital, though this would leave her grandson as the future Warden of the North, so again, the motives may not be entirely altruistic here. Since the scheme is undermined by Tywin, we will never know for sure. Marjorie may not have the foresight of her grandmother, but she is one of the best players of this Game of Thrones. She's subtle in her manipulation, but influences the lords and ladies around her at all times. Even when at war with Cersei, she's able to make herself look more pure and innocent by the day. Since she uses these powers for good, we have to count them in her favor. The weakest members of House Tyrell are Sir Loras and his father Mace. Loras Tyrell, the Knight of Flowers as he's known, had more depth in the book than the show had time to give him. He often comes across as pompous and self-involved, let us not even mention the fact that he's the one who goaded Renly into starting his own army, prolonging the war by years. Mace is, for lack of a better term, a pushover. He isn't the brightest flower in the garden. Mostly, he's happy to serve whomever seems to have the most power at any given time. He even turns his back on Cersei when her power is in decline, despite the fact that she'd made him the master of coin. Then we have House Tully. This was originally Caitlyn's house, but we've already counted her in with the Starks, since she was the mother of five northern children. For the Tullys, we'll be looking at Brendan and Edmure Tully, her uncle and brother respectively. Brendan, also known as the Blackfish, is by far the strongest Tully. 
He knows how to do honor by his family name, even while serving a king less than half his age. He respects the traditions of his house, which she eventually dies to protect. Edmir is, in contrast, the weakest Tully. He lets his pride and want for glory interfere with the orders that Rob has given him, ultimately leading to the failure of the northern armies to bring down the mountain and turn the tides of war. He's also reluctant to correct this mistake by pledging himself to Rosalind Frey when doing so seems to mean the failure or success of their army. He shows cowardice, ignorance, and impatience, but he's not actively malicious, and for these reasons, redeeming House Tully overall to be good. Rounding out the good tier is House Tarly. Now, the Tarly that we get to know and love is obviously one of the best characters of the show. Sweet-natured, book-loving Samwell is a bastion of gentility and a fierce fighter against the army of the dead. He kills a White Walker, a Then, and does everything he can to arm the Night's Watch with information that will keep them safe. He goes so far as to study at the Citadel with two wildlings that he rescued himself. Unfortunately for the Tarly name, he's not the only one to have it. Long before we ever see his father, Randall Tarly, at Horn Hill, we're made aware of his cruelty. He makes Samwell take the black as soon as a better heir is given to him under threat of death. He is none too pleased to see his son again, also during the brief stint he has on screen. Nothing is ever good enough for Randall, and honestly, it's a relief to see Sam get out of there for good. Now we move into the tier of bad and evil. Near the top of the list are the bad, where great and terrible deeds of a house pretty much cancel each other out. Toward the bottom of the tier, you'll find the truly irredeemable evil. The first up in this section is House Targaryen. We don't deny that this will be a controversial ranking, but I hope we don't have to resort to a trial by combat. The entire history of this Westeros timeline is built upon the fact that the former ruler, King Aerys Targaryen, was mad and wanted to burn the entire population of King's Landing. But we aren't looking at the extended timeline here. We're looking at the Targaryens that are presented to us over the course of the show, which includes Daenerys, Viserys, Aemon, and most questionably, Aegon, who we know as Jon Snow. While some of the largest crimes of the entire series are committed by Daenerys herself, we would argue that her own good deeds outweigh the bad. She crucified over a hundred masters on the walk to Meereen, and the controversial finale saw her burn the men, women, and children of King's Landing. The population had already been lowered by Cersei's stunt with the wildfire ruining the Sept and taking thousands of lives, so we don't know her exact body count there. We imagine it pales in comparison to the thousands she saved by freeing slaves in Astapor, Yunkai, and Meereen. Not to mention all the free cities that were not sacked because she rallied the brutish Dothraki to her cause in Westeros. While her glowing record certainly doesn't cancel out the blood on her hands, it's worth mentioning she contributes to the good more often than to the evil. Mother of dragons, sentence you to die. Westeros would likely have fallen without the help of her dragons. While she does commit a couple atrocities, she also incites some of the biggest reforms of the entire show. She fights for those who need it most for several seasons, and her moral compass was strong right up until it cracked. So let us look at the other members of her house. The weakest Targaryen is, of course, Viserys. He's violent, abusive, and would have done his mad father proud had he not been too weak to wait out his own trials. Fortunately, he is killed just six episodes into the show, and even Danny doesn't miss him much. The strongest Targaryen, from a moral perspective at least, is Jon. We know Jon as a Snow for most of the series, but in truth, he is Lyanna and Rhaegar's true-born son, Aegon Targaryen. He's far from perfect, but he's one of the bastions of good within the realm from as early as season one. His fight against the White Walkers saves countless lives, and his bold decisions commanding the wall give countless more the chance at lives as well. If you don't think of Danny as a good character, which, let's be honest, we would understand at this point, it's worth mentioning that Jon is also the one to prevent her from taking the throne after her massacre. Let's take a look at Aemon as well. He's the master atop the wall for the first half of the show before the old age finally takes him. He was put through many trials as he saw practically his entire house eradicated without his help, but he kept his vows and served the Night's Watch all the same. He does a good job there as well. He watches over the Brothers Black with reason, justice, and an understanding demeanor. We were all sad to see when his watch ended. I grew up in King's Landing. Following them is House Baratheon. 
This is a complicated one, and there are plenty debates about who all should be counted as a stag for the purposes of this list. We'll be counting Robert, Stannis, Renly, Shireen, and Selyse Baratheon. Though Robert did have three children who all officially lived and died as royal Baratheons from an official stance, we all know they were Lannister bastards. His bastard and eventual heir, Gendry, won't be included on the list either. Once becoming a Baratheon, he hardly has enough screen time for it to make a difference one way or the other. Our final and perhaps most divisive decision is not to include Cersei in the list of Baratheons. Though we've mostly been counting married women under their husbands' banners, Cersei never once identifies as a Baratheon. She claims her children are Roberts and clings to the title of queen that her marriage to him offered, but she is and has always been Cersei Lannister. You annoy me right now. Every breath you draw in my presence annoys me. That being said, we want to look at the strongest Baratheon, Shireen. Stannis' daughter has an absolute heart of gold. Despite having an abusive upbringing and serious physical deformity, Shireen is one of the brightest and happiest children ever to know life in Westeros. She teaches Sir Davos to read, as well as Gilly. Even before her death, she's trying to do all she can to help as Princess Baratheon. Stannis and Solis, on the other hand, both lose a lot of credit for arranging her to be sacrificed to the Lord of Light. This was done under the directive of the Red Priestess, Melisandre, but that doesn't really make it much better, does it? As a matter of fact, some of the most disturbing acts of the show were committed by Stannis because he was listening to her. This includes the murder of three kings through blood magic, the kidnapping of his own nephew, and, of course, the birthing of a shadow baby. He was also a hypocrite. He has the reputation of being an honest, overly stern man who abides the letter of the law, but he lets his thirst for the throne lead him into the darkness. He begins burning people for their beliefs, sacrificing the innocent, and keeping his strategies secret from the people who could have set him straight. Robert was possibly the most beloved Baratheon on the show, but unfortunately his utter incompetence as king did a lot of damage. You got fat. He was cruel to Cersei before she turned on him. He was a drunkard, he was reckless, and he sought his own pleasures to the detriment of the realm. He realized his mistakes in his final hours, thus appointing Ned the protector of the realm until Joffrey could come of age, but at that point, it was already too late. This leaves us with no one but Renly to look at. It's hard to say this because we love Renly as a person, but he was perhaps the most selfish of them all. We agree with his sentiment that Stannis would have been a terrible king, but rebelling against him for no other reason than he sought the throne was only ever going to end with more bloodshed. The entire War of Five Kings could have been avoided were it not for this fatal mistake. Following the Baratheons are their tormentors throughout the series, House Lannister. If it were not for a few characters, House Lannister would easily have been in the running for the gold medal of evil. But as we said, there are good deeds to help bring them closer to the middle. The Lannisters are known for their greed, detachment, pride, and of course, debt repayment, often through violent means. The Lions of Lannisport and Casterly Rock are both forces to be reckoned with. Each and every member has a few skeletons in the closet. The weakest Lannisters in terms of morality are the twins, Cersei and Jaime. Tywin was a powerful and cruel man, but he worked for his family as well as himself. This was a trait he couldn't instill into his two older children. Cersei has her father's cruelty, but none of his prudence. She has his affinity for scheming, but none of his foresight for the greater picture. She knowingly has three of her brother's children, a fact that endangers them and the realm through multiple wars. She has other crimes as well, such as arming the faith militant, but once you've started enough wars, the little stuff just doesn't seem to matter as much, does it? Jamie, likewise, is willing to attempt murdering a child in order to preserve that secret. He's often a victim of Cersei's abuse as much as anyone else. Much to our viewing displeasure, he seems to treat her in kind. He at least has a redemption arc that he completely undermines in the final few episodes of the show by sleeping with Brienne and then returning to die with Cersei. Uh, the strongest Lannister is, of course, Tyrion. He's not perfect either. He was good at making compromises politically, but less so in his personal life. We always see him doing all he can to exacerbate a situation between him and his family that he knows is bad already. Also, he does murder his one love on the show. She didn't give him much of a choice, but it's worth bringing up. All the same, we think he's a great character. His scheming is often used to benefit everyone, not just himself, and most of his worst actions are taken only in the interest of his survival. He's a great negotiator, a smart asset, and has a truly good heart. One of the best examples of this is when he stands up to his father rather than to bet his wife Sansa Stark against her wishes. The Lannisters we didn't mention are the Lannisport Lannisters, Kevan and his son Lancel. Needless to say, they both have negative traits, but walk closer to an honest path. 
Following them is House Greyjoy. No one in House Greyjoy is without their sins. This is particularly apparent with the first Greyjoy that we meet, Theon. While he overcomes more struggles than practically anyone on the show, we also see the cowardice, greed, and disloyalty in him. He did try to take Winterfell from Rob to appease his father. We think the weakest Greyjoys are Euron and Balon. Balon is weak as a character, in every sense of the word. Though he once launched fierce rebellions, we meet him as a broken man still mourning the loss of his sons, even the one that still lives. Euron is just downright evil. He ends his own exile by murdering his brother, and then tries to steal the salt throne from his niece. The fact that he teams up with Cersei in a poor play for the Iron Throne makes us quite glad to see his ships burned. Aeron Greyjoy is also weak, though largely just from development issues in the show. Our choice for strongest Greyjoy is Yara. My crew would wait on deck for a year if I asked them to. Though she doesn't have the same intricate arc as her brother Theon, she's far more certain in what she wants. She does everything she can to defend her brother, even staging a rescue for him when he's held captive at Winterfell. She does this against her father's wishes because she knows it's what's right. When her uncle takes Pike from her, she saves those loyal to her cause by making an alliance with Daenerys, back when that was a good thing to do. She was not perfect, but she was a very strong-willed character who was righteous in her own way. Following them is House Aaron. John Aaron sounds like he was an amazing and fair man. The memories shared of him imply that he had the honor of the Starks, but all the sense that they were lacking. Unfortunately, we never get to meet him. One of the show's first great mysteries is who was responsible for his death. So we have to judge the house based off the sickly Lord Robin and his deranged mother, Liza. We know that Liza was being manipulated, yes, but she's responsible for John's death. She poisoned him so she could be with her true love and then blamed the Lannisters. This sowing of doubt between the Lannisters and the Starks was what started the rivalry that would ultimately culminate in the War of Five Kings after Robert's death. We don't think that was her intention, but the fact that she didn't mind starting Starting a war to marry Peter speaks volumes. Furthermore, there's her treatment of her people. The Veil vale seems to have no problem with her exactly, but there's no denying that she's cruel. People are starved, frozen, and punished into false confessions where rigged trials lead to guilty victims being pushed to their deaths. She's raising Robin to be selfish and cruel as well, as we can see with his fascination with watching people fly. <laughs> Following House Aaron is House Clegane. For this slot, we'll be looking at the Mountain and the Hound. It's hard to really hold all of Sir Gregor Clegane's many, many crimes against him because after season four, he's pretty much a rage zombie created by Kyburn. But even before that, he was a monster. He was violent, strong, and had some of the worst rage issues we've ever seen on the show, which is saying something. When he and his brother were children, Gregor burned and permanently scarred Sandor's face. Needless to say that neither the years nor the knighthood made him any kinder. He's done much, it seems, to earn the nickname of Tywin Lannister's Mad Dog. One of the last acts we get to see him commit before he's subjected to Kyburn's experiments is to confess to the rape of Elia Martell along with the butchering of her and the murdering of her children. This is all shouted at Oberyn Martell as his head is being literally crushed between the mountain's hands. Sandor, on the other hand, is more of a nuanced character. He does plenty of bad things. He kills Micah, the butcher's boy, and serves as Joffrey's protector for the first stretch of the show. He offers to save Sansa and actually does end up saving, in an attempt to ransom, Arya. So far, he's filled with a mixed bag of morality at best. His crimes and good deeds continue to push both ends of the extreme. He steals from a family that feeds and shelters him, then he defends Arya in a fight against the crown. All in all, we think that he had a good heart deep down. Unfortunately, it was just too well buried to outweigh the crimes of his big brother. Taking the bronze medal of evil is House Baelish. Like Brienne, Peter Baelish is alone in representing his house. That being said, he has enough influence in the realm that we feel comfortable giving him, and him alone, the Bronze Medal of Evil. He believes that chaos is a ladder that wise men, such as himself, can climb. It is little wonder, then, that he is the one to manipulate Liza into murdering her husband and starting the War of the Five Kings. During that time, he promises Caitlyn he'll help Ned, leading him astray and then betraying him. He says he'll look out for her children, but then brings one to the Vale to be courted by him and abused by Liza. After he kills Liza, he sells Sansa off to the house that was responsible for her brother's murder, allowing her to be abused horribly by her husband before hoping, we believe, to take her for himself and become Warden of the North. Most of the events we see south of the Wall are set into motion by Littlefinger for his own gain. Every war, every battle, and death therein can be laid at his feet. 
Taking the silver medal of evil is House Frey. This is not entirely unlike House Baelish. Mostly the evils of House Frey come from just the one person, Walder Frey. He's an ancient old man who cares little for his oaths and vows, but will remember and punish each perceived slight against him. Because he holds the twins, he can get away with basically extorting anyone who needs to get anywhere in a timely manner, including kings. There's also this weird little habit of his of marrying one young woman after another. While it is customary in Westeros to try for multiple heirs, and not unheard of to take more than one wife in a man's lifetime, the fact that he keeps going through them shows just how little protection he's willing to offer. Then there's the creepy age gap to consider, as well as the general humiliation he submits all the wives to. We know he doesn't do this for the sake of family either, since there are already more Freys occupying the twins than he knows what to do with. He can't even keep the names of his daughters straight. We digress, these are small crimes in comparison to his biggest sin, the Red Wedding. Under the guise of a treaty for the slight Rob Stark has done to them, Walder Frey gathers the Northern armies under his roof for a feast. He gives them salt and bread, offering them guest rights, before seeing that they're all massacred. This was not only heartbreaking and petty, but is considered one of the greatest possible sins in the eyes of the gods. Luckily, we see him live long enough to be punished for it. Unluckily, he could not have achieved such a thing alone. Speaking of which, the gold medal of evil goes to House Bolton. As we were just alluding to, the family patriarch Roos Bolton helps turn on his king to arrange the Red Wedding. Unlike some of the other dissenting houses in the north, this comes from nothing more than the opportunity to further his own name. He even gets a wife out of the deal and a handsome dowry for her. Then there's his son. Before we even get to the heir of the house, it's worth mentioning how that heir was conceived. Roos explains in detail that he forced himself on a grieving widow of a lord while said lord's body was still swinging from the tree where he was hanged. When he fathered a bastard that way, Ramsay Snow was born. Since he was eventually naturalized by King Baratheon, we unfortunately have to look at Ramsay's track record also. He liked to torture people. Taking too much inspiration from the flayed man banner of his father's house, Ramsay delighted in cutting bits and pieces off of his victims. There's more than one instance where we see he actually has flayed a full man, or woman, though even these pale in comparison to some of the cruel and elaborate mind games he likes to play with those unfortunate enough to be taken by him. He also has a pack of hunting dogs that he likes to send after his ex-girlfriends. One of the show's most grueling scenes was his bedding and subsequent abuse of Sansa Stark, who we've known since she was a child. He inadvertently destroys his entire house after killing his father, his mother-in-law, and her new baby boy, just to ensure that he would be the heir to the Bolton lands and titles. Still, he didn't go down without a fight, or without killing Rickon Stark on his way out. And that's been it. Our rankings of Game of Thrones houses from good to evil. Who do you think represented Westeros morality best? Who gave you the most nightmares? Let us know in the comments down below, as well as what other topics you'd like to see us cover. While you're down there, don't forget to like and subscribe. And as always, stay wicked.